Talk about being five foot two is that no one can see you behind the podium, so I'm going to stand out around here. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is the collaboration uh, that uh, Quantum DX and Sheffield University and Newcastle University um, have undertaken as part of our development uh, of our handheld uh, medical diagnostic technologies. Um, so I've got Dr. David Williams here, who is representing uh, Newcastle Univers sorry, uh, Sheffield University, and I will also be talking about Newcastle <coughs> University as well, and we're doing a big collaboration. So about Quantum GX, um, we're quite a young company, we're only four years old, but our technology has been in development for the last six or seven years when we took it out of another company. Around six million has been invested in the technology, and our whole focus is on developing handheld medical diagnostic technologies and DNA sequencing technologies as well. We're a very small team um, in terms of the actual uh, board of directors. We've all got healthcare backgrounds or pathology backgrounds, so we're actually not very scientifically based, but we are very healthcare based, which is uh, why we try to drive our technology down the healthcare route. So we've actually uh, got ourselves, we've got Professor John Byrne, who's actually 60 today, so I'm going to be going up to Newcastle to celebrate his, uh, his big 60th birthday. We've got John O'Hanron, who's our group uh, CSO and the inventor of our enabling technologies. Uh, we've got Julian, who knows his surname, he's also my husband. And Paul Fitzpatrick, who is our US director, um, we have a presence in the US to see that market. And we've also got Sam, Dr. Sam Whitehouse as well, who's probably very well known to all of you. I'll tell you a little bit more about how we post him later. <laughs> Sorry, Simon. <laughs> so, um, the growing problem, when we were in healthcare, um, and I was managing a lot of hospitals, and working out what we're going to do with the pathology departments, and also what we're going to do with long-term healthcare, is that we felt that diagnostics was going to play a major role in the future. Uh, and in particular, complex diagnostics, molecular diagnostics, or DNA-based diagnostics. Uh, one of our aims has always been to try and put a laboratory into a physician's hand, or indeed into a nurse or health uh, professional's hands. Um, and that requires a lot of complex uh, requirements. As you know, many of you have been uh, involved or are actually working in laboratories, and there are many processes or lab processes involved in actually getting a sample uh, two results in order to get a diagnostic, um, a diagnostic result. Right now, uh, molecular diagnostics or DNA-based diagnostics are very expensive. They take a long time, which causes a lot of patient anxiety. Um, and too long results are potentially inaccurate as well with the type of underlying technologies used. Uh, so what we need to do, we're looking for um, rapid, cheap diagnostics that are very accurate, very cheap, able to be delivered at the patient's side, uh, and in the doctor's hands. So as I said, we need to place a laboratory in a doctor's or a nurse's or a health professional's and DD military's hands. So what we decided was we were going to take a whole bunch of uh, lab, lab processes, miniaturize them, and put them into a handheld device. And this is what we've actually done. What we've done is taken each of the lab processes involved in diagnostics, and then worked out how we miniaturize them using different nanotechnologies, um, different uh, different uh, telecommunication technologies, different other scientific technologies as well. So it's not traditional, the stuff that we're doing is not traditional by any sense of the word in diagnostics. We've got, literally gone around the world and worked out how to miniaturize diagnostics using existing technologies. Um, really we've not done, I mean, we've not done anything too special, we've just gone around the world and worked out how we can do it and then either in license things or actually uh, developed our own proprietary IP around uh, functionalizing basic technologies. So what we've done is we've now got a, a handheld uh, device, I've got a raw handheld device right at the moment, we're still in the development stage, um, but the heart of this is a nanowire biosensor, very similar to a computer chip, but we use little nanowires, um, I'm, I'm a non-scientific person, so I say little fuse wires, tiny, tiny fuse wires, that we've functionalized with various chemistries, and added things onto them so they will detect DNA very quickly. And what's the beauty of this little biosensor is, is that we don't need to use uh, optics, we don't need to use fluorescence, we basically convert um, electrical signal into binary code, which then gets fed back into the computer uh, instantly, and an instant result is actually delivered. So why on earth do we decide to go down the, um, the, the handheld uh, route? Well, as I said, it costs a lot of money, um, complex diagnostics. 
So what we're trying to do, or aiming to do, and indeed we're very close to doing it at the moment, <coughs> is to do sample to result in a handheld in under 15 minutes. And by sample, I mean any particular sample. We're working on blood, we're working on urine, uh, working on feces, sputum, but also we can do tissue as well, and potentially rock. We just got a new, new piece of technology now where we can use to do rock, so we can actually go to the environmental side. So complex diagnostics then produce a very complex diagnosis I'm talking about, around about 2,000 pounds a test, uh, taking three to four weeks, maybe even six months in the term, in the case of DNA sequencing, and bringing it down to initially the 100 pound mark, then the 10 pound mark, and our ultimate aim is to do a dollar a test, testing for complex diagnostics. And uh, all our mathematical modeling show that we can, we can achieve this with reduction. We're very, very keen as well on uh, looking at uh, emerging drug resistance, particularly for um, infectious disease testing. We've, we've heard about MRSI, uh, MRSA and C. difficile and other such uh, um, infectious agents. But also we're looking at HIV, TB, um, and just general pathogen detection as well. Our aim also is to try and reduce follow up appointments by being able to diagnose there and then at the patient's side. Um, and ultimately, we're reducing and eliminating capital costs of uh, laboratories and time to transport as well to central laboratories because we're putting a central laboratory into your heart, into the palm of your hand. So, uh, currently, we're aiming for uh, currently working on companion diagnostics. Um, a very cheap warfarin test as well, warfarin dosing test, but we're just checking for three snips to test whether or not we're actually going to bleed out uh, if you have warfarin after a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, we're working on STI and HIV testing, and that's particularly out in South Africa where we're based as well. TB and malaria testing as well. Then ultimately we start to roll things out. <coughs> so we have some major problems when, uh, when we're actually developing <coughs> our technologies. It's very difficult to try and, try and put all the lab processes, sample preparation, uh, DNA extraction and sorting, amplification, thermocycling and detection, all into one little tiny device. So we had a lot of headaches in, in the early, early stages. But one of the problems we also had was that we're an SME and we're not a university spin out at all. So our reputation, um, because we didn't have a university attached to us, our reputation was a bit low at the time. So we had a lot of doors slammed in our faces. Um, which is quite hard. Also money as well, SME, we have a big mortgage and such like, so the owners are actually funding the company. At the time I didn't know anything about grants at all, so um, so we were just a difficult situation. So what we ended up doing was going overseas. We went out to Singapore to look at the biosensor, we went out to uh, South Africa to do uh, some of the biomarker stuff, we went to Germany, we went to the States, everywhere but the UK. We've got a lot of problems with that, logistical problems, but in particular, um, some of the chemists we have major problems with, which uh, David is talking about. So, with all these lab processes, but the ones we want to focus on, which metric ended up helping us enormously with, and from that, there's been an amazing snowball effect uh, subsequently from the small bit of funding we initially had and the networking we had. But I want to go to look at the biosensor and the chemistries. So initially the biosensor we were working with a number of companies, but particularly out in Singapore. And we were in licensing then, and that's not very good when you actually want to have your own device. It's quite expensive. expensive. And then the chemistries we had a major problem with when we were functionalizing our biosensor to be able to read DNA. That caused a major problem because uh, basically our chemistries weren't working at the time, so we didn't really have a product. So what happened? Um, I don't like to like, it's always embarrassing to tell this story. I went to Amsterdam, I was giving a speech in Amsterdam, and uh, before that I remember going to, uh, I think it was a Welcome Foundation or something, and seeing Metrics um, uh, board up there, and I pointed to ignore Metrics, I didn't like their name and I didn't know anything about it. So, uh, so I ignored them then. Then I went over to Amsterdam, gave them a presentation, and uh, the then business development manager, Dr. Sam Whitehouse, was there, and that we at the time. And uh, I didn't realise that Sam actually had a chemistry background. I was going through major problems at the time with our chemistries. Sam took one look and said, these chemistries won't work. I think I know a man who knows what to do and how to make it work. So that's when I was introduced to Metric and to Simon. And uh, then it started a lovely relationship. What I didn't realise then was Metric had uh, small amounts of money or big amounts of money to invest in companies just like uh, Quantum, uh, but also to bring together the academic and industrial collaborations. Um, and for us, actually, it's worked fantastically well. It really has. And then from just a small amount, which we'll talk about in a moment, as I said before, it's snowboard. 
One of the first projects uh, that we did was a little 10 k project that Metric funded. Um, we put in 20,000, so it's about 30,000 in total. And that was to get a second iteration of our own biosensor. So very we have used uh, Singapore's biosensor, we now wanted to make our own mammal our biosensor. So, uh, so we went to Newcastle University, they introduced us to Newcastle University, and in particular INEX, who, have, um, who work in NanoWise. And INEX then did our second iteration under metric funding for our NanoWire biosensor. This is quite a large biosensor, this is a re research one, it's about an inch by an inch, which is way too large for putting into a point of care device. But the bit in the middle, this little bit down here, is where the NanoWires are, and that's what it looks like in close up. These here are just lead out wires, and can you see we're doing various um, uh, uh, multiplexing and such like to be able to get rid of these uh, lead out wires. But what we've done is um, we've, we've built these now biosensors and we're just functionalizing them with our chemistries. And, and this particular one is um, three lines, and each one of those will be pro um, uh, have a tactile probe onto it so we can actually detect various diseases. We can, we can literally pro put um, hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of different probes onto these nano wires. And at present, we're working through a project where we're just basically removing all of these nano wire um, lead out wires and just focusing on that little bit here, which is around about a millimeter. And that one, that little millimeter holds, I think, about 250 nano wires right now. So we can look at 250 different attributes and different analytes. So, so I have been developing our DNA sequencing chip, which doesn't look like that. This is our DNA hybridization chip, which we're putting into our point of care device. But ultimately, the DNA sequencing uh, chip is able to do very long read length, short read lengths, um, uh, and such like. So this is a very, very basic idea, just to give you the scientists in this room, um, just showing that uh, we can identify easily a wild type and mismatch uh, base. Uh, mutation in the breast cancer gene, the BRCA gene, um, and the evidence is very compelling indeed that uh, you can actually identify a wild type and um, uh, uh, a match of a wild type. Uh, anyway, what we see here is that you, the nano wires aren't very uniform, which is why we don't have um, complete uniform data here. What we've done now is actually we've worked through that and we've now got very, very uniform, um, very reproducible nano wires that are excellent for putting into a diagnostic device. So, the start of a beautiful relationship <laughs> with uh, Ms. Sheffield. As I said before, we were promised the earth by a CRO on the chemistry side. And for two years, and around about £250,000 of my money, uh, we had absolutely nothing at the end. Uh, and that's really bad in terms of functionalizing our nanowires. A semi metro metric met the sound, we proposed an industrial and academic partnership uh, with Dr. David Williams' group at, uh, at Sheffield University. Uh, David, uh, David is a nucleotide uh, chemist specialist and took one look at what these other guys have been doing. And basically, within about 30 seconds, I said, This won't work, it will never work, and you've wasted your money for the last two years. But I have a plan and I know how to do something, so I can help you. So, in the end, we ended up having some further metric funding, which actually ran simultaneously with the Newcastle funding. So, metric uh, not only provided us with a little Sort of seed capital as well for two specific projects, but uh, they also introduced us to a wealth of different partners as well who could help us also with our other technologies. But uh, today's, today's uh, presentation is all about uh, Sheffield and Newcastle as well. So, chemical expertise at Sheffield and then expertise in nanowire map manufacture from Newcastle University. So, I'm just going to hand over to David now. Yeah, I think I'm switched on here, so... Thanks, Elaine. So, um, what I thought I'd do in the last five minutes or so, just say a little bit about the chemistry that we've done and how it's fitted into to the method project and how we've interacted with the quantum DAs. So, as Elaine has already said, um, one of the main interests of quantum DAs had was that they wanted a um, DNA sequencing method that could work for their handheld devices. And our background is in uh, nucleic acid chemistry and nucleotide chemistry. And essentially, we got introduced to them by Sam Whitehouse, who knew something about what we did in the ship. Okay, so, um, I actually come to two projects 
copies of the Formula Renault for most of our existence were in Sheffield. The other one was to do with the electronics of these devices. In Sheffield, um, we had money for um, a few months of a postdoc study just to get started on this. But essentially, what we did was to start work on what we call these supercharged nucleotides. And I'll just say that a little bit about what those are in a second. So, um, the principle here is, uh, for those of you who maybe don't know a great deal about DNA and DNA sequencing, here's a piece of DNA that you want to know the sequence of, these are the bases here. We want to know what these bases are, and the way in which we do that is that this is attached to a nanowire, and if we incorporate a nucleotide that a base bears with G, for example, C, then we get the change of resistance of this nanowire. So the principle in chemistry is that Here's the building block here. This is the correct building block to go here. We take the DNA polymerase, it incorporates the correct base, we get the change in the electrical field, and then we remove this group here, and then we go to the next one. So the only the correct base over here gets a change in resistance of this nanowire. So these are the sort of things that we have begun. Um, synthesizing. So the idea here, here's a, a triphosphate building block for DNA synthesis. And the idea here, here's a charge group that we attach to the basis, and we have a group here, um, which we remove after the incorporation, and we also remove this after the incorporation. So um, that's the principle of what we're doing. So, so um, what have we done so far? So uh, we had three months of postdocs it started on making these nucleotides. And from that, we got an extra three months of money from EPSRC files here. And at the end of that time, we had a, a prototype nucleotide that kind of showed that this methodology went for pretty small work. Um, since then, Quantum DX have got funding um, from uh, the uh, National Health Service. And we've also got funding from BBSRC for a case award stewardship which started this year. Um, we've got a second student who started this year, and we are starting for the student this year. We've also got two students in Newcastle who are sponsored by the case. And the negotiation at the moment is a postdoc who will start working in my lab collaborating with the student in and uh, the X also had an application with this technology to the EU, which is down here. So, um, really, what we wanted to do is just to give you an idea in principle of how we got together. So, we got introduced through my um, contact with Sam Whitehouse. And um, what we're doing now, so, can I use a little bit about uh, what benefits have been to you? This is what you're doing. Yeah, we've had fantastic benefits. As I said before, um, we were an SME that didn't have an academic partner, which actually went against us considerably. We now have uh, two academic partners amongst yeah. others, which has really helped us in terms of, of, of winning grants and such like. Um, we've been opened up to a world of expertise and a world of facilities that uh, with our small amount of money, we're not actually able to um, uh, accommodate within our own uh, headquarters. So suddenly we've got this, uh, this world of academics and, uh, and, uh, and expertise. Um, uh, we're on our way to hopefully in the next year or so commercialising our first product, thanks to Newcastle and Sheffield University, and ultimately to, to Metric as well. Without them, we would have actually probably been another company that's just a statistic and a liquidation because we couldn't get our technology to work. Um, I said we went to the States uh, last week and actually we were resound a resounding success. We had so many other biotech companies wanting to, to look at us, so many VCs as well. So we're looking at going down the VC route as well to more, uh, for additional funding. Um, we've got incubator and incubation facilities. We were a London based company, but we actually made the decision to move up and go to the Centre for Life in Newcastle. So uh, that's another win for the north of England as well, thanks to you know, the initial side of metric, uh, metrics uh, investment. And also we have a highly collaborative environment. We have had some great times with David and some great times up at Newcastle as well. Because the way Compton works is very friendly and very much collaborative and very much a partnership. And we like to have fun as well. And uh, hopefully we do have a good relationship. We see each other very regularly, probably about uh, once a month, maybe five weeks. I know Sam and Sam's uh, in Newcastle as well. Sorry, Sheffield and Newcastle as well. So we get to see people most weeks. 
Um, and yes, I'm sorry, so I'm going to be coached too. <laughs> but then that's a good career move, I guess. <laughs> okay, and I, I just thought, just on the last slide of the I should say just a little bit about, obviously it's quite clear how important it is, but we've got a bit as well, because these, these are really problems that we wouldn't have looked at the in our group. It's a whole set of expertise that we have within the group that we want to keep going, so it's quite nice to have another use for some of that chemistry, and that can actually be really useful in keeping that expertise within the group. Um, Finally, we both like to thank measuring for getting things started. And we would also like to thank all of you. Um, and we're going to stay with the questions. Thank you. Right, thank you very much for that great presentation. Uh, has anyone got any questions? Um, right, for your, for your basic DNA sequencing technology, uh, how long can you sequence basic? You are measuring the conductance in here. Uh, 10 days a day. 10 days a day. Um, yeah. If you want to have much longer. Uh, we can do it all. Another technology that working, we're working on at the moment, which allows the divide, as you, you probably recognize, the nanowires, um, the actual signal gets uh, less and less and less the further away from the nanowires you get. Um, what we've done is actually we've changed things around, so uh, we've actually laid out the uh, we've laid out the nanowires in uh, rail track format. So as it, as the um, DNA goes through the polymerase and gets added on, it gets uh, it, it runs alongside and parallel to the nanowires, so we never have a problem with the divide length. Uh, and also our long our linker chains as well get longer and longer and longer. This is something that we're working with. So if we can monitor the length of that through the suspicions. Yeah. So we have a number of uh, different projects on the sequencing side running together, both red on track and also non linking as well. Anyone else got any questions? Uh, right. Right. Um, Elaine, uh, by looking at uh, short sequences, do you get around some of the, uh, the patterns that some of the companies like say Myriad Genetics? Um, I, mean, I, I know there's stuff going on in the courts with this at the moment, but um, is that an issue for you? Not at all. No, not, not at all. Um, we've got a, a lot of intellectual property uh, that we've patented out in the States. But uh, I know the Myriad case very, very well, and, um, uh, and I've been watching it very closely as well. But we don't, because we're able to sequence things, it's, uh, we're not infringing on, on their patterns, but also we can sequence the whole, the whole lot as well. But um, it's interesting, I mean, we're kind of going away from the bracket side because it is very messy at present. We're focusing on other things, um, like infectious diseases, sequencing like infectious diseases, looking at the drug resistance susceptibility from different uh, mutations which are around. But the bracket one is a nice a nightmare, and we'll probably just leave you to that. Although it's up with the principle, we leave you to learn what type of large box. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs>